Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion with indefinite integrals. So in the previous video, we talked about how to use the evaluation theorem to find out the area bounded by a function using an antiderivative. Well, in this video, we're going to talk about the indefinite integral of a function. We're going to talk about the inverse relationship between integration and differentiation. The net area can be found for a function over a closed interval, and then also use the net change theorem to find out how to calculate distance and displacement of a particle in motion. All right, so let's continue our discussion on indefinite integrals. We need a convenient notation to represent antiderivatives. So this is a continuation of what we were talking about back in chapter four with antiderivatives. Antiderivatives come up so often with the evaluation theorem that we introduce the notation for definite integrals. Well. Let's see if we can use a similar notation to represent the family of antiderivatives or the general antiderivative, also using integral symbols. So the notation integral of f of x as the integrand and dx where x is the variable of integration, but notice that you do not have limits of integration. This is called an indefinite integral and what it represents is that it's the antiderivative of lowercase f of x. So if you have an indefinite integral symbol, you do not have limits of integration. So indefinite integral f of x dx is the general antiderivative of the integrand. Always remember the constant of integration. So always add in the plus c when you have indefinite integrals. And keep in mind that capital F of x is an antiderivative if the derivative of the antiderivative is the original function or the integrand. So the connection between indefinite and definite integrals is given by the evaluation theorem. So if f of x is a continuous function, as we talked about in the previous video, on a closed interval, then the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b, f of x dx, you calculate an antiderivative. That was the first step in the evaluation theorem. And then we evaluated when x is equal to b, which is the upper limit of integration, and subtracted when we evaluated the antiderivative at x equals a. So just a reminder that the capital F of X is an antiderivative of lowercase f of X on the interval I. And the most general antiderivative of lowercase f of X on the interval is capital F of X plus C, where C is any arbitrary constant. So in other words, if you use the indefinite integral symbol of F of X dx, then it's the general antiderivative or family of antiderivatives of the integrand. So an important note is that the definite integral will be representing the area bounded by the curve and the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. So it will be a real number for the definite integral. But an indefinite integral will always be a family of functions. It will represent the general antiderivative. So you'll never have a real number attached to an indefinite integral. You'll always have an arbitrary constant plus c and a family of functions. So the effectiveness of the evaluation theorem depends on having a supply of antiderivatives. We cannot use the evaluation theorem from the previous video unless we can calculate the antiderivative of several different types of functions. So we can evaluate an antiderivative once you have the antiderivative calculated and then the evaluation theorem said you need to use the limits of integration to calculate the area between the curve and the x-axis and the lines x equals a and x equals b. So this means that we need to restate the table of antiderivative formulas that we had previously in the course. So this was a table of anti-differentiation formulas from section 4.8 on antiderivatives. And we're gonna have a few others in this table that we're going to start using the notation for indefinite integrals to represent the family of antiderivatives. So keep in mind that any formula that's in this table, you can verify by using the inverse operation, which is differentiation. So if you take the derivative of your antiderivative, you should get the integrand. So all of these properties are exactly the same as we've seen before. Notice that every single one of these antiderivatives formulas involves a family of antiderivatives with a plus c. So let's try example two. We're going to find the following indefinite integrals. All right, number one, 
Let's find the indefinite integral, so no limits of integration. 1 subtract t times 2 plus t squared, and the variable of integration is t. Remember when we were finding antiderivatives, we were just told find the antiderivative of this product. Well, now if we have the indefinite integral symbol, that still means the same thing. Find the family of antiderivatives. So we multiplied out this function, and we came up with 2 um, subtract 2t plus t squared subtract t cubed. And keep the dt because we haven't found the antiderivative yet. So now the first property that we talked about in the table was you can find the antiderivative of each term separately or the indefinite integral of each term separately. So the antiderivative of 2 is 2t. Antiderivative of 2t is t squared. So 2t squared over 2. The antiderivative of t squared is 1 third t cubed. And the antiderivative of t cubed is 1 fourth t to the fourth. Now this is an antiderivative, a family of functions. So always add on the plus c. Number two, let's find the indefinite integral of v times v squared plus 2 all to the second dv because the variable this time is v. So again, let's multiply out the integrand before we find the antiderivative. There is no reverse product rule for finding antiderivatives. So this would be integral of v times v to the fourth plus 2v squared plus 4 when you multiply out v squared plus 2 all to the second dv. And now distribute the v through the parentheses. So we'll have v to the fifth plus 2v cubed plus v4v dv. And now, again, use the property of, of indefinite integrals. You can find the antiderivative of each term separately. So antiderivative of v to the fifth is 1 sixth v to the sixth. Antiderivative of 2v to the third is 2v to the fourth divided by 4. The antiderivative of 4v would be 4v squared divided by 2 plus c. We have found out the family of antiderivatives. Now let's simplify. So this is equal to 1 sixth v to the sixth, or v to the sixth divided by 6, plus 1 half v to the fourth plus 2v squared and plus c for the family of antiderivatives. Okay, so those two were with polynomial functions. Let's try several involving trigonometric functions. So this time we'll have the indefinite integral of 1 plus tangent squared of x dx. So you might be wondering, I don't see tangent squared anywhere in the table of antiderivatives. Well, this is a trigonometric identity, the Pythagorean identity. It is 1 plus tangent squared of x is equal to secant squared of x. So we can change the integrand to be simply secant squared using this identity. So indefinite integral secant squared of x dx. And now this one is an easy antiderivative. Antiderivative secant squared is tangent of x. And this is an indefinite integral, so plus c, because it's the family of antiderivatives. So sometimes you may be looking for a way to simplify the integrand so that you can identify what the antiderivative would be. All right, let's try a few more. Number four, indefinite integral of secant of t times the quantity secant of t plus tangent of t dt. So the variable of integration is t. So notice that if you distribute the secant of t to both terms, you have secant squared of t dt plus integral of secant of t tangent of t dt. So notice that I've already broken up the terms into two separate integrals using the first property with indefinite integrals. Now the antiderivative of secant squared, that's tangent again, so tangent of t plus c. Let's call this one c1 because it's a constant of integration for the first integral plus the antiderivative of secant of t tangent of t is secant of t. And again, this is an integral an indefinite integral. So we'll have another constant of integration. 
But notice that if you have one constant and you add another constant, you just have one constant of integration. So this can be simplified to tangent of t plus secant of t plus c, where c is the constant of integration for the entire indefinite integral. Number five. This time we'll do the indefinite integral of sine of x divided by 1 subtract sine squared of x dx. So again, this one's a little bit more complicated integrand. Let's see if we can simplify a little bit before we find its family of antiderivatives. Well, notice that 1 minus sine squared, that is another Pythagorean identity from trigonometry. 1 subtract sine squared of x is equal to cosine squared of x. So this becomes sine of x divided by cosine squared of x dx. So again, notice that the integrand is not something that we've seen before. Let's see if we can manipulate the integrand so it becomes a little bit more familiar. So we're going to use a little trick. The numerator is sine of x. Let's write that divided by cosine of x. So we're going to break up the cosine squared into a product of sine of x divided by cosine of x times 1 divided by cosine of x. Keep in mind, if you're multiplying, you multiply the numerators and you multiply the denominators, so the, the denominator is cosine squared of x still, dx. Now the reason why we want to use that idea is sine of x cosine of x is tangent of x using a trig identity, and 1 divided by cosine is secant of x, dx. This integrand we know. The antiderivative of secant of x, tangent of x, is secant of x and plus c for the family of antiderivatives. All right, one more, number six. Let's find the indefinite integral of sine of 2x divided by sine of x dx. So again, this one, this integrand is not something we've seen before, and you cannot cancel the sine functions because the, the arguments of the sine functions are not equal to each other. But you can use a double angle identity, also from trigonometry. And it says if you have a double angle, like 2x, inside the sine function, it can be rewritten as 2 times sine of x times cosine of x. So we're going to make this substitution in the numerator. So keep the indefinite integral sign until we find the antidotes. It's 2 times sine of x cosine of x divided by, the denominator is just sine of x dx, and then this simplifies, because you have a sine of x divided by sine of x, indefinite integral of 2 times cosine of x dx, and now the integrand is much easier to deal with. The integral of 2 cosine of x is 2 sine of x, you keep the coefficient 2, and always remember for indefinite integrals, you have to add plus c for the constant of integration. So this gives you an idea of how to evaluate indefinite integrals. Especially with trigonometric functions, you may be looking for a trigonometric identity to simplify the integrand to become a more familiar integrand using the antiderivative formulas. All right, one thing left to talk about in this video, and we're going to talk about applications of the evaluation theorem. Keep in mind, the evaluation theorem was stated in the previous video. It's for continuous functions on a closed interval a comma b. So the statement with definite integrals was the integral from x equals a to x equals b of the integrand f of x, where x is the variable of integration. You find an antiderivative, capital F. You evaluate at the upper limit of integration. And then you subtract, taking the antiderivative and evaluating at the lower limit of integration where f of x is any antiderivative of the integrand. So keep in mind, with definite integrals, we did not have a plus c because we assumed that c could be equal to anything, because it could be any antiderivative. So we took c to be 0, just for convenience. Well, keep in mind, the definition of antiderivative was if you take the derivative of the antiderivative, you should get the original integrand. Well, this is the exact same formula. It can be written and called the net change theorem. So here's what the net change theorem states. An integral of a rate of change is the net change. 
So let's replace lowercase f of x with capital F prime of x. So the integral from a to b of capital F prime of x, that is the derivative of the antiderivative, where x is the variable of, in, of integration, is exactly what the evaluation theorem says from the fund, fundamental theorem of calculus. Take the antiderivative, evaluate at b, subtract the antiderivative, evaluate at a. So if you have a derivative as the integrand, you are finding the antiderivative still for the net change theorem. This principle can be applied to all rates of change that come from natural and physical sciences that we've talked about previously in the course. So where does this come up in applications? Let's say you have an object that moves along a straight line and the position function is s of t, then we know that the velocity is the derivative of position function. So let's just use the evaluation theorem with the s prime of t using velocity. So the integral, the definite integral from t sub 1, so starting at t sub 1 time interval to t sub 2, ending at t sub 2 time interval of the velocity function, well, the antiderivative of velocity is the position function. So you find the position function, evaluate at the upper limit of integration, subtract the position function, evaluate the lower limit of integration. This is called the net change of position. So it's telling you how much does the particle in motion change from T1 to T2. Or if you remember from the previous chapter, this is called displacement of a particle during the time period T sub 1 to T sub 2. So there's a few things we can review from the last chapter. If we want to calculate the distance that the object travels during the time period, we need to be very careful that the velocity is positive, greater than or equal to zero. That means the particle is moving to the right if the velocity is positive, because it is moving in a straight line. And if the velocity is less than or equal to zero, the particle is moving to the left. So you have to be very careful in terms of finding out displacement when you have velocity positive or negative. You could be moving right or left. In both cases, though, the distance is computed by integrating the absolute value of the velocity function. So velocity can be positive or negative, but if you want to find the total distance, you need to consider only the absolute value of v of t, which is the speed of the particle. So in other words, the total distance traveled of the particle in motion is the definite integral from t sub 1 to t sub 2 of the absolute value of the velocity function, where t is the variable of integration. So we're going to look at a figure that shows us the difference between displacement versus distance traveled in terms of area under the velocity curve. So this figure illustrates the difference between the two. Displacement is where the integrand is just velocity because the antiderivative will be the position function. So if you calculate the definite integral from t sub 1 to t sub 2, keep in mind that velocity could be positive or negative. It could be, the particle could be moving right or left. So your curve for velocity could be a positive value. It could be above the axis t, or it could be below the axis t. And again, a positive. So if you are calculating this definite integral, we took a sub 1 above the, x, above the t axis, and a sub 3 and added those two values together so a sub 1 plus a sub 3 but if the area is below the t-axis the horizontal axis then this value was considered negative so we subtracted a sub 2 so that's called displacement distance on the other hand total distance traveled is the definite integral over the same time period but it's the absolute value of velocity so you only want to consider distance when the Velocity is only positive. So it's a sub 1 is already positive value. So a sub 1, a sub 3, same reason. It's already positive. But the value of a sub 2 is negative. But the distance is what we want to actually find. What's the total distance the object has traveled? Well, we need to consider this to be a positive value when you calculate distance. So you're adding a sub 1, a sub 2, and a sub 3. All right, one more thing before we do example 3. The acceleration of an object... Keep in mind that the acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So the 
integral from t sub 1 to t sub 2 of acceleration is the antiderivative's velocity, evaluate the upper limit of integration, subtract the velocity, evaluate the lower limit of integration. And this is the change in the velocity from t1 to t sub 2. It's calculating the difference between the velocities. At so let's try those ideas that we've just learned in example 3. Suppose that a particle moves along a straight line, so the velocity, which is measured in meters per second at time t, is given by this function, quadratic function, t squared subtract t minus 6. We're going to use this function throughout the next couple parts. Part 1, find the displacement of the particle during the time interval 0 to 4 seconds. So we know that displacement from the previous page is equal to the definite integral from t sub 1 to t sub 2 of the velocity function dt, which is s of t sub 2 subtract s of t sub 1. All right, so displacement in terms of this particle in motion in the problem would be the definite integral from t equals 0 to t equals 4 of the velocity function t squared subtract t subtract 6 and the variable of integration is t. So we need to find the position function. So find the antiderivative of t squared, one third t cubed. Antiderivative of t would be one half t squared. And the antiderivative of six would be six t. Now keep in mind there is no plus c this time because this is a definite integral. We want to evaluate at t equals zero and t equals four. So the, um, the net change theorem says you take your position function and evaluate when t equals 4, the upper limit of integration, and then subtract the position function evaluated at 0 seconds. But 0 is a nice value for t because all these other terms in the second set of parentheses will just be 0. So 0, 0, 0, they just cancel out. So don't have to worry about that set of, second set of parentheses at all. The first set of parentheses will simplify to 64 divided by 3, subtract 8, subtract 24, which is equal to negative 32 divided by 3, or if you change this to a decimal, it would be negative 10.667 if you round the three decimal places. Now this is displacement. The units were meters. That's the change in the position function. So the answer is negative. That indicates something in terms of the, the um, motion of the particle. This means that the particle position at t equals 4 is 32 divided by 3, or about 10.667 meters, to the left of the initial position, which occurs when t equals 0. So since the answer was negative for displacement, that means the particle was actually moving to the left more than it was moving to the right. And it ended up about 10.667 meters to the left of where it originally started. Okay, and then the second part of this problem is not about displacement, but this time about the total distance traveled during the same time period. And we're gonna notice that there is a difference between the two answers. So notice, that the velocity function will be both positive and negative. The velocity function was t squared subtract t subtract 6. This is equal to, if you factor, t subtract 3 times t plus 2, so that the velocity function will be equal to 0 when t equals 3 or t equals negative 2 seconds. So notice that we're only talking about the time interval from 0 to 4, so negative 2 is not important for us. Of course, time can't be negative anyways. So t equals 3, the velocity function will change from either positive to negative or negative to positive.
it turns out that the velocity function is positive on the closed interval three to four and is negative on the closed interval zero to three. Okay, why is that so important? Well, we need to calculate the total distance. So therefore, the total distance traveled on the entire time period, zero to four, needs to be broken up into two different integrals. It would be the distance traveled This is the formula that we talked about before. It's the integral from t1 to t2, definite integral, of the absolute value of velocity dt. Well, for our problem, that would be the integral from 0 to 4, absolute value of the velocity function dt. But notice that this function, but notice that this function for the velocity is not always positive. So this needs to be broken up into two separate integrals. First integral from 0 to 3 of the absolute value of velocity, dt, plus the integral from 3 to 4, absolute value of velocity, dt. This is using the additivity property for definite integrals, where the first integral ends at t equals 3, but the other integral starts at t equals 3. Okay, so this first integral is 0 to 3. So this is on the time interval from 0 to 3 seconds the velocity function was negative. So keep in mind, the absolute value of v of t would be opposite of v of t, dt. If the velocity was negative, we want to make sure the absolute value changes to a positive value. Plus, the integral from 3 to 4, the absolute value of v of t, well, velocity is positive from t equals 3 to t equals 4, so the absolute value is not needed. It just changes just to v of t, dt. So let's make the substitutions for the velocity function. So 0 to 3, the velocity function, keep the negative. The velocity function was t squared, subtract t, subtract 6, dt. The second integral is from 3 to 4, same function, t squared, subtract t, subtract 6, dt. So we need to find the antiderivative of each integrand. So the first integral, the integrand would be the opposite of 1 third t cubed plus 1 half t squared plus 6t. So keep in mind the negative sign is going to change each of those terms. And then this will be evaluated when t equals 0 and t equals 3. The second integrand, the antiderivative would be 1 third t cubed, subtract 1 half t squared, subtract 6t. And this is evaluated when t equals 3 t equals 4. So the first integral will be when you substitute in t equals 3 first, evaluate that antiderivative at t equals 3, and then subtract the antiderivative evaluate at t equals 0. This will give you 27 divided by 2. And the other integral will be equal to 17 divided by 6. For the same reason, evaluate the antiderivative at t equals 4, and then subtract when you evaluate the antiderivative at t equals 3. And then this will equal 49 thirds, or if you change this to a decimal approximation, it's about 16.333. And this is distance, so the units are meters. So this gives you an idea of the difference between displacement versus distance. The displacement turned out to be negative 10.333 because the particle is moving to the left more than it was to the right. But if we want to calculate the total distance, we need the absolute value around the velocity function, and the answers will be different. So this finishes up our discussion on indefinite integrals, the net change theorem, and also how it relates with distance and displacement. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the second version of the fundamental theorem of calculus.